Hello and welcome to this week's program. I'm evangelist Peter Hockley from Oxford Bible Church. I'm so glad you're joining us today. It's a pleasure to be back with you sharing the Word of God and preaching the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In today's program we're going to be talking about the value of a soul. The value of a soul. And to begin with, let's read from the 8th chapter of Mark's Gospel, beginning with the 34th verse. And it says this, When he, that's Jesus, had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And I just want to read those last two verses again. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus had called the people to himself along with his disciples and he had talked to them about following him. You know, wherever Jesus Christ went, be it in Judah in the south, in Galilee in the north, whatever side of the Lake of Galilee he visited, whatever the smallest village, the remotest town or even the great city of Jerusalem itself, wherever Jesus went in his public ministry, he called and invited people to follow him. And wherever he went, people did indeed follow him. In their thousands, multitudes followed this carpenter from Nazareth. Some of them left their homes in order to follow him. They walked away from their businesses. They said goodbye to family and to friends. And they left their old lives behind in order to follow this itinerant miracle worker from Nazareth. And even, even today, people are following Jesus Christ. Don't pay any attention to the news that says that Christianity is passing away or is vanishing and dying out. Christianity is going nowhere. For Jesus himself said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And here today, I imagine watching this program, there are many followers of the Lord Jesus Christ from a diversity of backgrounds and languages and cultures, uh, people whose lives would have never before touched, never otherwise have come together, are united and drawn by the cords of God's love and are joined by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the tie that binds us. Praise God, my friend, what do Christian people look like? They look like all of us. And Jesus says in our text, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will he give in exchange for his soul? And we would be wise to hear what Jesus is saying to us today because everyone tuning into this program is in possession of a soul. You know, you may never have visited a church before in your life. You might not ever have touched a Bible before. You may have thought to yourself that religion and religious stuff has no relevance whatsoever to your life. But my friend, I hope that you will give me your attention for the next few minutes because today we're talking about your soul and whether you realize it or not, your soul is the most valuable thing, the most precious thing that you own and the most precious thing you will ever own. I'm talking today about the value of a soul. And there are four points that I want to bring out in talking about the value of a soul. Number one, I want to talk about the dignity of having it, the dignity of having a soul. And then mention briefly the danger of wasting it, the danger of wasting that soul that you have, which could lead ultimately to the disaster of losing it, the disaster of losing that soul everlastingly. And then we will conclude the program today by talking about the delight of surrendering it. So first of all, let's talk about the dignity of having it, the dignity of having that soul. And why is it that your soul is the most important and valuable thing that you own. Well, first of all, let's say that the soul is created by God. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being or living soul. You know, human beings are the final 
masterpiece of God's creation. They are the last thing that he created. And when God had finished uh, creating man and woman, there was nothing else that he needed to bring forth onto the earth. As soon as the human being had arrived on the scene, creation that was described as being good, God then declared to be very good and nothing more was needed. You know, sometimes the value of something is often determined by its creator. How many times have we heard that story about some valuable piece of artwork that has been lost and uh, left alone gathering dust in some loft somewhere, only to be uncovered after many years and discovered to be uh, the work of some master painter or master sculptor and is valued and sold for millions and millions of pounds. Yes, the value of something is often determined by its creator. And uh, the value of your soul is determined by the fact that it is created by God. But not only is the soul created by God, the soul is created in God's image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Human beings, as I say, are made in the image of God. We're not simply a higher form of animal life. We are created to be a reflection of God, able and capable to know Him and relate to Him more than anything else that exists. Even the angels, mighty as they are, brilliant as they may be, powerful as they may be, even they look on with awe at the simple human man and woman, even the smallest boy and girl, because when they see us, they see something of God that is not found anywhere else in creation. No, not even in themselves. Psalm chapter 8 tells us, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You know, you and I are more like God than anything else that God made. And that's why the fall of man, the rebellion of the human race, turning their backs on God is such a tragedy. Just look around the world today and see the results and the fruit of a human race that has refused to accept its God and see how people behave now across the world, selfishly, violently, indifferent and jealous, deceitful, wasteful, uh, mistreating one another, mistreating ourselves and mistreating this beautiful planet that God has given us to live on. You know, with most other things that are considered to be precious, the value of those things are determined by their rarity. Gold, of course, is more precious and more valuable than copper because it's rarer. Uh, diamonds are more valuable than the common stone and the average pebble that you will see along the way because they are rarer. Uh, you know, many times in my life I've uh, come across a stone that has found its way into my shoe, but I've never once looked down and found a diamond that has made its way into my shoe because they are rarer and therefore their value increases. But because of what human souls are, that is that they are made by God and that they are made in the image of God, they are infinitely valuable despite them being so numerous in number. There are billions of souls walking around on the face of the earth today in place of the millions and millions who were here in times past. And yet our value is not in any way diminished in the slightest by the number of us that are here. And if there was room enough for twice as many people as there are, uh, it wouldn't decrease our value at all. We would remain the highest thing in God's creation. What's also truly amazing, of course, is that human souls are not only vast in number, but they're also entirely unique from one another. God has created billions of souls, but he has never made copies. Uh, we are all wonderful and unique individuals. Even uh, identical twins are not exactly 100% identical. Uh, people who know uh, sets of identical twins will know this to be true in their personality and their character. They can be very different. They may look the same to the casual onlooker, but to their family and to their friends, to their loved ones who know them, the differences between them are sharply clear. But let's also say that the soul not only is created by God and created in his image, but the soul is also created to be eternal. Our bodies 
will die one day. You know, they will age and they will pass away and nothing special is needed for death to happen or to occur. Not a fatal accident, not a sickness or a disease. Just time by itself will do the job of bringing a man to the grave and nothing at all can resist time. Take the batteries out of your clock, pull your watch to pieces. The sun is still going to go down at the end of the day. The stars are still going to roll over your head. And with every new tomorrow, so comes nearer an end to this life on earth. But the soul continues after death. The body is just a house for our soul and spirit to live in temporarily. It's a tent that we will put off one day. But the real person, the immaterial, invisible, non-physical part of our nature will go on and will continue for eternity. We human beings have a beginning, most certainly, but none of us will have an end. And also I want to point out that the soul was also created for fellowship with God. Jeremiah chapter, 20, chapter 9 from verse 23 says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Yes, God says, don't boast about the money that you have, about the things that you have. Don't boast about the physical strength that you possess and all that you can do with it. Don't boast about the great intellect and the great learning that you might have gained over years of study and experience, says the Lord. No, he says, boast only about one thing that you, human being, are able to know me, are able to meet with me, are able to fellowship with me, are able to understand and have relationship with me. This is the only thing God says a human being should boast about and should boast about above all other things. God made you for himself to know him, to love him. Uh, and like a fish in water or a bird flying up in the sky, our right element, our proper environment is to be in the presence of the Lord. So we've talked about the dignity of having the soul, but let me mention also the danger of wasting it. Jesus talks about people gaining the whole world in our text, but notice that he also makes clear in Luke 12 and verse 15, Jesus says, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Life is not about material things, he says. Solomon, you know, was king of Israel some 3,000 years ago, and he lived in a vast and prosperous kingdom and reigned over a nation that enjoyed abundance and plenty. And unlike other kings at that time, Solomon never had to worry about the threat of war or invasion looming over him because his father, King David, had successfully subdued every enemy and defeated every threat that surrounded their nation so that Solomon never had once to pull on his armor or draw out a sword and go to fight. No, Solomon could simply live his life enjoying out his days, uh, enjoying all the benefits of being a king and enjoy them, he did. He ate the finest foods, he dressed in the finest clothes, he held the most sumptuous feasts and banquets for dignitaries, for royal visitors from other lands who were dazzled by both his material wealth and also his intellectual wealth. Solomon grew in substance, the scripture says, until the king made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stones, and he made cedars as abundant as the sycamores which are in the lowland. Think about it, silver and gold as abundant as common stones on the ground. The scripture goes on to say that all King Solomon's drinking vessels were gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Not one was silver. For this silver was accounted as nothing in the days of Solomon. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. But you know, as time passed and as Solomon gained more and more of the world, his having gave way to a pride that uh, led to an insatiable lust for more of the having. We're told in the scripture that Solomon ended up with 700 wives 
and 300 concubines. And I ought to give no more remarks on how that's a sign of his excess and his lust and his greed and his wastefulness. The book of Ecclesiastes is the account of Solomon's anguish and inner torment at having possessed as much as anyone in the world ever had and yet found no peace and no joy, only the rot and ruin of wastefulness and the bitter taste of a life that was filled with materialism but grew increasingly absent the spiritual nourishment that comes from the presence of the Lord. In the New Testament, of course, we read about the rich young ruler who had great possessions and yet felt there was something missing in his heart. He knew that something that ought to be there was not there. He wasn't satisfied. And so he came to Christ and it says that he fell down to Christ kneeling before him. He was a ruler, an authority, a VIP in the land. He knelt before no one and yet before Christ he fell prostrate. And Jesus looked at that man. It says in Mark's Gospel, Looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way and sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, take up your cross and follow me. But it says of that young ruler, he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Yes, he went away sorrowful. Notice that, not indifferent, but sorrowful. He knew that there was more to life. He understood that there was a meaning higher than the possessions that he owned, that there was a reality deeper than this physical life, and yet he couldn't let go of that drive to gain and possess the whole world. And so he forfeited his soul, the same thing that Jesus warned about. That young man found the truth and still walked away from it. There is a real danger of wasting your soul. It was given to you by God. It was made to reflect him, but sin leaves us adrift and cut off from him, thrashing about aimlessly, wildly. And that same Solomon we read about before in the book of Ecclesiastes describes people like this. He said, truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live. And it is madness and foolishness to think that you can gain the whole world because you never can. No one has done it. And you and I are not going to be the first to accumulate all the wealth and all the technology, to have all the latest fashions to acquire all the education, to be in a position to read all the books that have ever been written, to travel to every place and experience every sight, we're not going to do it. You can never even please every person that you meet in the course of your life and win them over and win their allegiance and make them your friend. No, we can't gain the whole world. But you know what? Also, the things that we do gain, we can't keep. I read somewhere someone who once said that uh, you'll never see a removal van behind a hearse. The man passes away, but all of his things stay here. And in uh, those ancient Egyptian royal tombs that have been discovered over the years, they always open them up. And what do they find inside? Treasure, gold, silver, precious stones, jewelry, and a mummified corpse. Old Pharaoh left all that stuff behind. Uh, They've even found clothes in some of these tombs, clothes that were supposed to be for the king to wear in the afterlife. But it seems that he went on his way without them. One more thing I want to point out, though, is that even if you could gain the whole world and keep hold of it for some time, it would never, ever satisfy. Physical and material things are not a remedy for the aching and empty soul. Our souls are crying out to be filled, and the only thing that can fill them, the only thing that can uh, fill the void that exists inside of us is the God who breathes life into human hearts. I wonder, my friend, what is the story of your soul? What journey has your soul been on? Where have you taken it over the course of your life? What are you feeding your soul even now? Even worse, though, than the danger of wasting your soul is the disaster of losing it. The disaster of losing it. Jesus speaks of gaining the whole world, and yet it's possible to lose the soul at the end. It's an awful thing to consider the loss of the soul, the fact that it can be lost forever. Ezekiel says in chapter 18, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine, says God. The soul who sins shall die. Yes, the soul who sins shall experience the death, the eternal everlasting death of soul. It's a disaster because when the soul is lost, its true value then becomes clear. You know, it's not like losing money or a job 
or a job opportunity even. It's not like the loss of possessions. You know, we can lose so much on earth and still have our souls intact. The sun rises in the morning and there is a new day and a new opportunity. There is another chance to make a change, to do things differently. And those souls that have been wasted, even over the span of years, have one more chance to look back to God, to come through Jesus Christ and be renewed and be cleansed, be transformed and made whole. However, once the soul is lost, it is irreversible. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, It is appointed for men once to die, but after this the judgment. There is no chance to come back and do this thing called life again once it's over. Be it long or short, this life will end, and after that follows the judgment. The soul that has lived on earth, uh, independent from God, separated from Him, in rebellion against Him in sin, and dies in that state, will remain forever separated from God with more, no more hope to find rest in Him. Here on earth, Salvation, forgiveness of sin, peace and spiritual satisfaction is offered freely by God through Jesus Christ. But the soul that says no to Jesus here cannot say yes to him once it has gone beyond the veil of this mortal life. And once the soul is lost, it is lost forever. Not only is there no more chance for the lost soul after death to find its way back to this earth, there is also tragically no end to the torment of its lostness for all eternity, where their worm does not die, the scripture says, and the fire is not quenched. But another thing to note is that what we accumulate on earth has no value towards eternity. You wouldn't give your eyes or ears, your hands or your legs for the world. No person in their right mind would uh, lose their hand or even a finger for a million pounds. You wouldn't exchange the use of your legs for all the riches or fame or success in the world. But so many are exchanging far more, their eternal soul, for far less. We've spoken about the dignity of having a soul, the danger of wasting it, the disaster of losing it everlastingly. But let's finish on a high note today by talking about the delight of surrendering it. And by that, I mean the delight of surrendering it to God, entrusting it to the care of the one who created it, making room in the soul for the Lord in whose image that soul was made. We're talking about the value of the soul today. And your soul is most valuable to God. He is the lover of our souls. And his desire is for all wayward souls to be reconciled to him. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That's divine life, the life of God that human beings were always meant to enjoy but lost in the fall. Life in abundance, to the full, till it overflows. Or you might be breathing in and out, my friend, but do you have that spiritual, eternal life? Not unless you know Jesus, for it's His to give, and He longs to give it. God Almighty has proved how highly He loves us and how valuable our souls are to Him by sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ gave Himself up for us all. He offered His own life on our behalf. He took the penalty and the punishment for our sin while He was on that cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us. The great prophet Isaiah said, All of us like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid on the Messiah Jesus the iniquity of us all. Yes, He suffered in our place, the innocent for the guilty, the holy for the unholy, the righteous for the unrighteous. But because He is the Holy One of God, death and the grave could not hold Him, and on the third day He rose again. And now all who receive Him, all who come to Him by faith, all who trust in Him, pass from death to life, from spiritual death, from moral death, from soul death, to real, supernatural, divine and everlasting life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Souls that were once empty and broken, in the hands of the Son of God they are filled and made whole. Souls that were torn apart by all kinds of sin, by years of addiction, by all manner of traumas, by a thousand different hurts, in the nailed, scarred hands of precious Jesus, they can be delicately healed, completely cleansed, totally forgiven of wrongdoing, and everlastingly transformed by the grace of God into a vessel of honor, able to be carried up by Him after death to live with Him in heaven forever. So what is it that must be done to surrender the soul to Jesus? 
Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. My friend, call on the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask him to forgive your sin. Commit your heart, commit your soul, commit your life into his hands. For he promises in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, says the Son of God. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, all of you who are burdened and weary, all of you who are tired, spiritually dry, soulishly empty. Come to me, he says, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So why remain separated any longer, my friend? Why stay apart from God a moment more? Backslider, why stay away from that God who loves you another moment? Come to Christ, come back to Christ. Put your soul under his tender care, and that eternal rest of soul that he promised will be yours also. Amen. Four Nights with the Devil, a true story of deliverance from evil, is my testimony of how back in 2002, as a young man on a spiritual journey, looking for answers and spiritual truth, I found myself involved heavily in the occult and engaging in occult practices, troubled and tormented by demons, until calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he rescued me and set me free. This book is available on Amazon or everywhere in the world as a paperback. It's also available as a Kindle download. I want to encourage you to get this book as an encouragement in your faith that Jesus is Lord over all devils and demons. Thank you for watching. Join with us at Oxford Bible Church every Sunday at 11 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time for our live stream service or join us at Cheney School, Headington, Oxford. OX3 7QH. You can watch more of our teachings on our Roku channel and Derek Walker's YouTube channel. All Derek Walker's books are available in printed and Kindle versions in all Amazons worldwide or online with other great products, where you can also support our programs at www.oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk or by calling 01865 515 086.